Welcome to Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. This show is dedicated to asking tough questions for you, the viewers. We bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Joining us here today at our Hebrew studio, no other than STEM owner, Caroline Pino. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So you opened up a dispensary in the city of Pebro. I did, uh, just one year ago. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Welcome as a business owner to the city of Pebro. Thank you. Walk us through the process of opening up a dispensary. Yes, it was a long process. Uh, we, began about, we began about three years ago um, and applied for an economic empowerment certification um, Haverhill is one of the areas designated as disproportionately harmed by the illicit market um, and the war on drugs. And because of that designation, um, people that live in that community that open up um, proposed shops um, can qualify for this certification. So that was our first application that we went through. Once we were selected as one of the economic empowerment applicants, we um, pursued with uh, putting together our, um, our massive packet of information to get a license. And then we waited. It was a lot of hurry up and wait, getting things ready for deadlines. Um, we had to secure a property, which is, was a huge challenge and hurdle and probably the most challenging part of the process. And we had to do so um, you know, with, with a, a bit of a leap of faith because zoning hadn't been finalized yet. Um, so we were pretty confident that downtown would be approved, but um, we, we took a bit of a, uh, of a risk by securing a property um, in the downtown zone before. We also work very closely with the city, um, business owners, constituents, to uh, educate about what cannabis would look like in the community. And we worked with um, the city council, various zoning boards, um, about setting up you know, appropriate zoning throughout the city um, and what that would look like for businesses. Um, so once we heard back from our application, then we built out our space um, and got approved for licensure. But it took about two and a half years to open. So when you say it took two and a half years, so the voters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts voted yes. to have legalized marijuana. So from the time that that vote was passed, how long did it actually take for you to open? So we didn't open until May of 2020, and I believe it was legalized in 2017. Um, we were on the earlier side of the industry, but certainly not the first to open in the state. Um, we were one of the first few independent operators and the second economic empowerment applicant in the state to open um, behind Pure Oasis in Boston. And if I recall, there was a lot of uh, people that did not want you to open STEM there. I believe there was even uh, lawsuits brought to you. Can there you was. talk about that? Yes, yes, there was an ongoing lawsuit um, over, um, you know, from some, you know, disgruntled neighbors um, that were not happy with us opening STEM in downtown, um, alleging that, um, it was not conducive, uh, STEMS operations would not be conducive to the downtown business zone and that we were um, opening in a park too close to where children congregate and um, that it just wasn't appropriate that was gonna drive down their property value. And those court cases continue to this day. Um, we have prevailed in the first one. They, they filed a preliminary injunction to prevent us from opening. Um, we defeated that, they've appealed that. Um, the, the, the appeal was dismissed and then they appealed that again recently. Um, so, you know, those are, those are ongoing, but uh, you know, I don't think they will go anywhere because a, a court has told them multiple times now that, that, you know, the case is not going anywhere. Um, that being said, we still are fighting it to this day. Um, and those are two of our neighbors in downtown, the hidden pig restaurant, um, and the owner of that building and, um, and Mark's deli. Mark's Deli, and I believe uh, there was a bar, um, the Hidden Pig, is that, that's the bar? Yes. Uh, I believe the Boston Globe had reported uh, recently that there was a uh, hit and run caused by someone that was drinking in that particular uh, uh, establishment, and they injured an off-duty police officer. Were you aware of that? I am aware of that. Um, uh, I read the Boston Globe article, um, and you know, it's. I think it highlights the the irony of um, you know them alleging that that cannabis would have a negative impact in the downtown, which it certainly has not. If anything, it's been a very positive impact, and uh, I just think it shows the irony. Um, you know that 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 alcohol can can have a, a negative impact. Um, 
more so than cannabis and no other liquor stores or bars are paying you know quote unquote impact fees and astronomical um, taxes so which is uh, which is surprising because uh, to my knowledge uh, I spoke with the city hall the mayor's office and you're right nobody else not even the liquor stores um, or the bars and I believe that your downtown area is surrounded by bars and restaurants, correct? Yeah, we're sandwiched between bars. Um, and we love our location. It's right in the heart of downtown. And and for me, it was really important to be located in downtown because I think it's important to dismantle the stigma that exists around cannabis. So many people use cannabis for health and wellness, um, medicinal purposes, and just to feel feel good. And, um, and that shouldn't be a shameful thing. Um, we want people to feel safe, comfortable, secure in our store. And we want it to be, um, you know, we call ourselves, you know, the local joint for all, because, you know, no matter who you are, um, you can love cannabis and, and use it. It doesn't matter what age you are, what you look like. Um, so we really wanted, it was important for me to be just right down on Washington Street and to fight for, for, for having um, a cannabis in a location that wasn't kind of pushed into the outskirts of town, which is, I think, what the discussion was initially. Right. So, and um, there is uh, rules and regulations that were set forth by the board that oversees the cannabis and all that stuff. That, that, they were appointed by the governor. Uh, so they've made all their rules and regulations. How, much, how many loopholes did you have to go through before you were able to, to get your license to be able to open? Oh, I couldn't even tell you the amount of um, effort that we had to go through to secure a license. It's not an easy process. Um, it took a lot of patience, conviction, um, and support from you know my family, my friends, um, people in this community really rallying behind us. Um, but the the license process is long and challenging. Um, so there, it was really uh, a precious moment when we were able to open in the middle of COVID. I was nine months pregnant. I'll never forget it. Um, but it, it was a really gratifying moment. Well, and you had a boy or a girl? I had a little boy and I also have a daughter. Well, congratulations yeah, on you. your newborn. How old is your daughter? My daughter has just turned four and my son will be one on Saturday. Oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, congratulations Thank again. Thank you. Now, um, the regulations that were set um, on the 3%, that, was, uh, that wasn't done by, that's done by the city? So the, um, the, the law says that legal cannabis, the local option tax, a city or a town can enact a local option tax, tax of up to 3%. So all communities have, have done the 3%. And then in addition, um, as part of the license process, you have to negotiate with your host community, in this case, the city of Haverhill, what's called a host community agreement. And it's commonly, um, you know, the short of it is HCA, an HCA agreement. As part of that HCA agreement, one of the provisions that t cities and towns can ask for is up to 3% of gross revenue um, to be set aside to the city of Haverhill in this case um, to mitigate any negative impacts that um, the presence of our operation could have on the city of Haverhill. So we did sign an agreement with the city of Haverhill um, that said that we would agree to pay an impact fee of up to 3%. Um, the, so long as the costs were reasonably related, and that's the exact language, reasonably related to our um, impact and our operation in the city. So I'm aware that the, um, so when you opened up your business and you had all these negative attentions coming towards you and all these roadblocks, how'd you, how were you able to survive? How would you, how were you able to deal with all the stress with the courts and, and, and dealing with the city and all the loopholes? Yeah, that's a great question. I just had a deep sense of conviction that I was doing something not only that I was passionate about, that it was going to help a lot of people. Um, I think it's important to create meaningful spaces in our community where people feel safe and can gather around a shared passion and interest. Um, we're not just a cannabis store. We're a community gathering place. And um, it feels really good to come into our store to shop. Um, and that was important to me. So I kept that, 
you know, at the forefront of my mind at all times as something that was going to drive me. And and um, also, interestingly, lots of people told me, no, you can't do this, including the mayor of Haverhill, who said, you'll never open in downtown Haverhill. Um, so anytime someone tells me no, it just drives me even harder to to go after something that I'm that I'm very um, confident and 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 passionate about. So how how does the impact fees work for you guys where nobody else in the city of uh, Haverhill has to pay an impact fee? Why the cannabis? Yeah. So that was something that was um, kind of thrown in at the 11th hour of um, of them passing the um, legislation to legalize and tax cannabis in the Commonwealth. And it was thrown in as an incentive for communities um, because everyone was nervous that cannabis, all the unknowns of what it would be to welcome, welcome cannabis into a community. Um, and you know, all these fears around what that would look like. So that was thrown at the, at the, at the kind of like final stage. Um, and what ended up happening is none of those fears ever ended up materializing. So here you have this language that says, sure, communities can, um, can, mandate that their um, operators commit to this 3%, um, you know, quote unquote, impact fee. Uh, but it, it does say in the law, the mass general law, that these fees need to be documented and that they're public record. So that's the law. And then the agreement that I signed said that the costs need to be reasonably related. As part of our license renewal process annually with the state, I, as an operator, in order to keep my license, must request of the city those documents. So I started that process last July and have have not yet gotten a response. Which is interesting because this show has also uh, done some public records requests to try to obtain some of those documentations. We have uh, sent some document uh, freedom requests, uh, FOIA requests to local communities around Haverhill, and we've gotten the response. Um, but we haven't gotten one from Haverhill. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because back in March 18 of 2019, um, I, I came across a letter that was uh, sent out for accountant of revenue. So I'm kind of curious to, to know how does the city determine what impact came from your business? So they're supposed to keep separate line items. Um, it, it, that's what the law demands, the, that documentation be kept for any reasonably related costs that ha are associated with my business. Um, they never did that. Um, and um, to this day, the only documentation that they have sent is this catch-all letter um, that, that alleges that STEM's operation has had a negative impact um, of increased domestic violence, increased um, drug use in schools, um, parking, um, enormous parking fees that they, they need to pay for. And quite frankly, those allegations are offensive um, and they have yet to substantiate any of them. So we've never said we wouldn't pay impact fees, but I have a right to know what those impacts are um, my agreement cuts both ways. The, the city of Haverhill keeps saying a deal is a deal. Well, a deal cuts both ways and the city needs to follow the law. And I don't think it's unreasonable to request of them um, that they share the documentation um, for such a large amount of money that they're requesting. It's, it's incredible to see how much money they're requesting, but how much money some people will look at it and it's, it's extortion. In my eyes, I look at it, I read the documentations, like how, I don't know if you recall, there was a uh, mayor for, uh, mayor from New Bedford that was recently indicted and Yeah, and Fall, Riv Fall, in Fall, Fall River. River, yeah. Fall River, mm -hmm. um, and he was uh, charged with, um, uh, what was it, uh, Taken yeah, bribe. Yeah, and and so so the difference uh, between that case is that um, he was taking um, payments directly to his to campaign account, and it was a criminal activity. Um, but some people in the industry have said that um, you know these are, are are legal forms of extortion, um, the way that the the law is written, because you do need a host community agreement in order to operate in a community. So when I went before the city of Haverhill and sat with the mayor of Haverhill. Um, you know, he told me no problem, you know, we'll be happy to account for those fees down the road. But if you don't sign this, there's someone else out behind you that will. 
Um, so, you know, I take that as sign it or you're out of luck. You don't get a host community agreement. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's been an, an interesting topic of discussion in the industry because if you don't foot up what a community is looking for, you won't be able to operate your business. What's the bidding process for to even start in that aspect, like to get your license? I mean, how, how does the bidding process work? Uh, in terms of working with the city of Haverhill and how they who they select is going to operate in their city, correct? And how they who and who determines the the price of what it is to to get into oh the it. price of entry Correct. yes oh in the host community agreements yes so um initially the city of haverhill was very um disorganized when it came to even figuring out this process so it, was, it took a lot of patience on my end initially we proposed our own um host community agreement which was not accepted um and then they came and they put the document down in front of us um there was very little room for um you know what they call negotiation um and we did bring to their attention um that all impact fees must be documented and reasonably related to cannabis uh, dispensaries operations and that in the future these agreements could come under scrutiny um, they did not seem concerned and um, you know held fast to what they were proposing and we ultimately had to sign the agreement if we wanted a host community agreement and the kicker is you can't apply to the state until you have that document from the city so it gives the city a tremendous amount of power uh, which i don't think was intended by the um by the legislation but it's um and so they're they're starting to do some reforms and there's some bills in the legislature right now to to revamp that process a bit um, but what it did is it created a pay-to-play environment in communities and some of that impact fees uh that you would be paying would be going to conducting youth uh, risk programs and also I see substance abuse uh, counseling as well, adding additional social workers to our high schools and middle schools as well. Uh, so you're actually paying their salaries. Yeah, so the interesting thing about this is uh, the city of Haverhill has been asking for this for three or four or five years now. So it's just a convenient thing for them to send and say, they, they still haven't shown that there is a direct link between what they're alleging we need to cover, you know, and then they go on to say, um, you know, domestic violence and, um, and increased drug use in schools, but there's no documentation of any of these alleged impacts. Um, so, you know, I, I, I understand that they want to use this as a revenue building opportunity, but that's not what the law indicates that it is for. It's for direct impacts on my cannabis stores establishment in the city of Haverhill. Um, and so I I await this documentation. Um, the mayor has mentioned that, um, you know, back in a, a city council meeting back in March or February that um, he doesn't plan to provide this information because it is, um, you know, no other community is doing it, um, even though that's what the law demands. And so we look forward to holding the city accountable um, to following the law which they're required to do. Um, and we are fully confident that our um, suit against the city, um, we, that we will prevail, prevail in that lawsuit. And I also believe that uh, in our public records request, we found some document uh, prohibiting you or prohibiting employees, the city employees from having conversation with you in regards to getting this information. Can you tell us a little bit about that? There was a, um, a, a, a letter that was um, published in, or a, a part, portion of a letter that was published in the Eagle Tribune that said uh, that I, if anyone had contact with me, that, um, that they needed to report it back to the city solicitor and they needed um, you know, documentation um, that or correspondence that any city employee might have um, uh, had contact with me within 90 days. Um, so it was, it was pretty appalling, um, you know, that that, you know, if all I'm asking for is transparency. So if you're not trying to hide anything, why send something or, like that around? Well, it seems that you are paying the salaries of those individuals as a taxpayer, as a business owner, as a resident of the city of Haverhill, public servants work for the people. And Look at the loopholes that you have to go through to get answers. What needs to be done to, to change that that cycle that everybody deals with on a daily basis? Yeah, I think ultimately the um, 
the legislature will need to get involved and um which will never happen because they're all attorneys up there <laughs> and as you can see attorneys are always leaving loopholes yes. in the system and look at what you're going through i have um spoken before um the joint committee for cannabis policy um they are looking at it but that takes time um we have tremendous support in our local legislature and um local state senator have um have authored bills to help try to get some reform and transparency around them this they understand the problem around these fees and that it it needs to be dealt with at the state level the state is what built this law they need to fix this breakdown in the system um, because it's impacting a lot of people, a lot of independent operators um, can't get, even get in, get their foot in the door in this industry because of these fees. Um, so it's a real problem, and I am happy to take a stand um, and use my platform as a business owner in Haverhill um, to highlight this lack of documentation that communities are providing. It's not okay. It's not following the law. And if what I'm doing here in Haverhill can help shine a light on those things and help other people, I'm happy to move it forward. How do you see STEM doing from the day you started now? Um, have you witnessed any violent crimes in front of your, your store? Have you witnessed any accidents in front of your store that could be potentially related to an impact fee for you? I've witnessed nothing. But yet we have a next door neighbor establishment who is publicly known was uh, intoxicated they ran out of the establishment they hit an off-duty cop and there was no impact fees for that and alcohol is a little bit worse than campus as far as i hear from from people who do use it you know yeah. so from what i understand there has been no um, implication for that business and and no impact fee or anything of that nature so currently the city council yesterday did not vote on a budget. Does that mean that there is no 3% for your organization, for your business? I think I was proud to see that the city council voted down the mayor's budget last night because they're taking a stand on the mayor's political agenda that he's trying to push. Um, and all they're asking for is that so many of these wonderful programs for our youth be supported through the tax revenue that STEM and these other establishments pay, which is also 3%. So not to be confused with the 3% impact fee. The mayor wants to put the 3% tax revenue into the general fund. The city council has advocated, and the reason they did not vote for the budget last night is because the mayor is refusing to use the marijuana tax revenue in any way but the general fund. And they are asking that it be line item to support really important programs for our youth. The mayor is insisting that the cannabis impact fees, which we know need to be reasonably related to STEM's operation, he's insisting that that money be escrowed for um, things like ski lessons and swim lessons for our youth, um, which are wonderful programs and by all means should be supported by our tax revenue. But the cannabis impact fees are for impacts directly and reasonably related to my operation and the other operations in town's impact in our areas. So the reason that the council, in my opinion, pushed back last night is because the mayor is trying to take the tax revenue from cannabis and put it into what he wants to put it forth. And then he's trying to say, the only way I will fund these things is if we use the impact fee money. But the council know that, knows that the impact fee money is being challenged right now, and rightfully so. Um, so they don't that might, that money might not exist, and they still want to fund these very wonderful programs. Um, and so the mayor is making it out like if they don't vote for the use of the the funds the way that he sees, which is to use these you know in my opinion erroneous impact fees, um, that for some reason they're going against the youth of our city. And for someone that doesn't know this issues and the intricacies of it, they'll probably take the mayor's word for it, which is a shame. Um, and it, the mayor, I'm sorry to cut you off. The mayor did, um, <laughs> excuse me. The mayor did state that turn, voting down the budget would affect all those programs, the children and so on. That's because he refuses to put the tax revenue towards those programs. He wants to use the tax revenue for whatever the heck he wants to use it for. He wants to use the impact fee 
to fund that. And originally, he wanted the impact fee to go into the general fund also. But the impact fee, let's not forget, is for reasonably res- related expenses associ- that the city's incurred directly related to an operator owning a cannabis establishment within the city of Haverhill. And that requires documentation, it requires transparency, and it's supposed to be public record according to Mass General Law. The mayor never mentions the law. He never mentions the tax revenue that we already pay of 3%, which the city has never had before. Our first year, we um, contributed 365,000 in tax revenue. Before you even open. No, this was for our first year. Oh, the first year. Okay. Yep. And really, the consumers pay that, but in sales tax, our business pays paid that for our first year in operation. That's tax revenue the city has never had before. A wonderful source to fund all of these uh, programs for children, to fund the youth drug surveys, uh, to do all of these things that we haven't had the revenue to do before. But he is um, being very stubborn and persistent about insisting the cannabis impact fee money be used, despite not providing any documentation that there has been any negative impact. It's very interesting, and I'm going to um, look. We're still looking into uh, some FOIA requests and some public records requests. Hopefully, we have some documentations for when the mayor does come on our show later on in uh, next month in July. We have given him an invite. Um, walk us through what people will see when they come and visit your establishment. Great question. They will be greeted with a warm smile. Um, they'll come in the door, they'll get their ID checked come into our store and see a menu um, with over 135 various um, cannabis items from flour, pre-rolls, concentrates. Um, We have salves, tinctures, um, but we have most importantly a great staff from all corners of our community um, that are passionate about sharing their love for cannabis and for helping people. Um, so we work closely to make sure people feel educated about what they're purchasing. A lot of people, it's their first time either buying legally or coming into a store at all. Um, so it, it takes a certain amount of disarming people and making sure that they feel comfortable and supported um, in their cannabis choices. Um, we source the best product that the state has to offer on the legal market. Um, and we have some beautiful um, hand-blown glass accessories. Um, so you'll come in and the, it's pretty quick in and out, but we'll talk to you as long as you, as long as you'd like about cannabis and, um, and then you'll leave and go home and consume in private. Nice. And what kind of, uh, COVID protocols do you have in place for, for those residents that, you know, want to go and visit you, but don't feel safe going into a a place that's crowded and so on? Yes. Um, so right now there, we're at a hundred percent occupancy, um, as the governor has lifted the restrictions on, um, but during COVID, um, everyone wore masks. We limited the number of people in the store. Um, we, most of our staff, I think 97% of them are fully vaccinated. Um, if you're not vaccinated, they're required to wear masks. And we ask the same of our, um, all of our, um, uh, every, anyone that shops at STEM, if you're vaccinated um, or not vaccinated, rather than we ask that you wear a mask um, to protect yourself. And if anybody wants to go and visit STEM, what are the hours and what days of the week can they go? Yes, yeah, so we just increased our summer hours. We're really excited about it. Um, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., Thursday, Friday, Saturday and 12 noon to 7 p.m. on Sunday. So we're open seven days a week. And um, we hope that that's a wide enough uh, range of time that, you know, no matter what your occupation um, and your day-to-day, that, you know, you can find some time to come in and and shop with us. That is awesome. I... I walk by, I drive by your uh, your store all the time. Um, it's beautiful front, out front. Um, I know you have your security guards out there. And uh, on my way in, I noticed that there was um, one of the other shops that is operating in the city uh, had a lot of tr- police traffic over there. Uh, yes. Did you hear anything or know anything about what happened in that area? I did. Um, I do think that they had an incident with... Um, 
with someone that that tried to rob them. Um, it's it's a very um, sad situation. Our heart goes out to that business and um, their customers and their community and their staff because that's a scary situation. Um, but you know, things like that do happen at, in all industries and in all businesses and in all cities across the Commonwealth. Um, thankfully, to the quick action of the police department, um, you know, our, our um, they apprehended the suspect really quickly, and um, you know, all was all was well. Great job to the Hebrew PD. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, why don't you give out your uh, business address so anybody that wants to find you, they know where to go. Yes, I would love that. Um, we are located at 124 Washington Street in downtown Haverhill. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. We have a lot of fun on our social media sites. Um, at STEM Haverhill is our Instagram handle. So um, come visit us online. Come visit us in person. Um, my husband and I are there pretty much all day, every day during the week. Um, we'd love to meet you and chat all things cannabis. Perfect. And I look forward to having you again back on our show to uh, follow up on the uh, impact fees, uh, especially after the budget is approved. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come in and talk to us. You've been watching Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. Join us next time as we go behind the scenes to ask some tough questions, bring you their responses. We let you decide. Thank you very much.